So let's start. Welcome everyone to today's event. It's a premiere for us with this kind of format. Fingers crossed that everything works as expected. My name is Peti Koch and I'm your host from the Java User Group Switzerland. Hello, my name is Alexandre Kuba. I'm here from the community of Software Craftsmanship Romandich. And our guest today is Sandro Mancuso. Welcome, Sandro. Hello. Pleasure Hello, to have everyone. You here. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, a lot of people know you, Sandro, but not everyone. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Ooh, okay. Uh, so, what are you famous for, for example? <laughs> I think that probably like the, the thing that is more relevant is uh, I was a a guy that really liked. I was a, a software engineer by trade. This is how I started my career. Worked as a developer for most uh, of my career. Loved Agile as soon as it came up. And I think that what I became more known by is is starting the craftsmanship, so, uh, the software craftsmanship community in London and then writing a book about it and helping other communities across the world to to learn about craftsmanship and are just sharing my passion for the, the subject. Okay, thank you very much. So we will talk a lot about uh, software craftsmanship. Uh, we have prepared some questions. So um, the structure of tonight's event will be, we'll, we will have uh, first uh, a one hour fireside, fireside chat um, in that setting, just the, the three of us um, and the fire. And if, because if because it is a fireside chat, we have prepared also uh, something to drink. So cheers, everyone. Cheers. Now you can interact with, with us. You have the chat, for example, in the big market platform. Please, uh, maybe you want to write something in it. Uh, where are you from? How is the weather? Are you also having a drink? Something like that. Mm -hmm. Then there is the question and answer tab where you can post a question. We will try to pick them up and uh, ask Sandro and discuss it. Um, you will. You also have the possibility to upvote the questions. So we will see which are the most uh, interesting questions for you. And uh, from the technical perspective, um, there's a technical delay from about 15 seconds. So maybe uh, we react a little bit delayed, not just because of the red wine, but because of the technical <laughs> delay. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Then after this uh, first one hour fireside chat, uh, we will move to uh, a Wonder Me uh, session. Wonder Me is a spatial video conference chat where everyone can move freely. Like in a pub, you go to some person and start reading, uh, start talking with each other, uh, or then you move, speak with someone else. Sandro will also join us, and we, you will have the possibility to interact live uh, with each other and with, with Sandro. So did I forget anything, Alexander? No, I think you do know okay. everything. It's fine. You're so, the boss. No. <laughs> so let's get started with the first question. What actually is software craftsmanship or software craft, which uh, some people nowadays call it because of the gender discussion? And what's different from software craftsmanship or software craft to software development and software engineering? So I don't have a short answer for that. So I think that in order to answer that, I'll need to tell you a little bit of history uh, of why it came about uh, that might explain what it is. So as I was saying at the beginning, like, I started my career as a developer. So back in the 90s, like, the, the, the default, the most common approach to software 
uh, project management in software was the waterfall. And there was also the unified process for those of you that are old as me might remember the, the iterative process it started just before agile, like the, the, the rational unified process yeah. uh, was one of the, the ones that became a little bit more popular. So, and then in 2001, as probably most of you uh, are very familiar with, um, 17 people got together. They went to a ski resort in Utah with no birds, and they uh, discussed about different ways of building software, right? So that meeting was called by uh, Uncle Bob. So there was a combination. Uh, Uncle Bob, Alistair Coburn, and Martin Fowler were thinking about doing the same thing. So they combined their email list. They invited 25 people or so, 17 accepted, went to the ski resort. And in there, there were representatives of different uh, methodologies or ideas. So there were the, the Ken Schwaber, uh, and Jeff Scrum. Sutherland yeah. from Scrum. There were the uh, Kent Beck, Ron Jeffries, uh, mainly from the extreme programming, Chad Hendricks and people like that. There were the Dave Thomas and the Andy Hunt from the Pragmatic Programmers. There was Alistair Coburn with Crystal. There was FDM. There was like, quite a few. So basically, those people had different ideas of how to do to, to build software in a more efficient way. And what they had in common, all those methodologies from the more technical, the most technical one that is, is extreme programming to the more process focused one that is Scrum, because the other ones are somewhere in between, was a very short feedback loop, right? So that, that inspect and adapt at different levels. And that was what called Agile. So they, they created an umbrella to all of those methodologies and they named Agile and they came up with the manifesto. So just for some context, and the, re the reason I like to, to give that context, because I realized that that was 20 years ago mm -hmm. and not every, unlike most people potentially watching this talk, it started their, their career not longer than 10 years ago. Some of them even five years ago. And their view of the world is very different from the people that were there when those things happened, right? So anyway, so Agile took the world by storm. Everyone loved the idea, including myself. So developers like myself back then, I said, wow, this is freedom. This is, this is amazing. This is like gonna really help to empower us. As developers, we will be closer to the business. We will be, we will be collaborating with more people. We will be listened to. We will not be that someone that just receive a pile of requirements anymore. We will be actively part of the process. And software engineering will be at the center of those decisions of in projects. So this creates a big excitement for all of us. And I embraced it wholeheartedly. But unfortunately, what happened in the, the following years, that family, that, that 17 people, like they had their own views of the world and they wanted to push in different directions. And Scrum, for example, I, I say I always say that is a blessing and a curse at the same time. It's a blessing because Scrum became far more popular. It had a much bigger appeal to businesses. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not here to criticize Scrum, by the way, because I think that uh, companies were far better adopting Scrum than they were without it. So Scrum became very popular, and the process side of Agile really was embraced by a lot of organizations and those organizations were better. Regardless if they adopt that well or not, they were better than they were before. But the technical side of agile, disciplines like cross uh, extreme programming and things like that were left behind and that created a friction in that original community. And that put people like, like myself that were more technical focused, uh, we were a bit disappointed with that imbalance. Not that we were disappointed about Scrum. We were disappointed of the lack of balance of the process and technical disciplines. So if we fast forward a bit, that, that gap between the two became bigger and bigger, the process and the technical aspects in the agile world. And that made some of the technical people, including Uncle Bob, very disheartened because like a few years later, what Agile became was, was different from the original intent mm -hmm. because the adoption was par a partial adopt, adopt, adoption. So then we had a lot of companies 
adopting the process, but not the engineering side of Agile. So that created a counter movement because there were people like myself and many others that were disheartened by that, that created a counter culture. And that's what we call software craftsmanship. So back in, in so then in 2008, a few people looked back, including Uncle Bob, and say, hey, we need to, this is, what we have today is not that it's evil, but it's not what we originally intended. So then they, they, they created a new movement called software craftsmanship to try to push the, the, the bring back the technical focus, the, the, the focus on developers. But what, what is important to remember also, the, the reason that I tell this story is because you see much what happened in society today, right? So when, when the, the needle is too much in one side, in order to start moving the needle back to the needle, mm -hmm. you need a very strong response. Mm -hmm. So the craftsmanship movement was a counter movement. And, and most of us, when it emerged in Chicago, and I, I was following the work of some of those people, I fell in love with that and I brought to London very quickly. Uh, but we were a bit more aggressive. Like Bob gave loads of talks criticizing Agile and I did the same. But because it was a counter movement, we were trying to bring the needle back. But for that, either because we were a bit naive or we felt that we had really to criticize in order to move the needle. But, but this is what craftsmanship became at the beginning, is that focus on technical excellence in, in, in the engineering side. And at the very beginning, there was a friction. Yes, there was. And we helped to create that friction with the Agile community. And of course, that this was not welcomed by the Agile community. What became the Agile community? That was more focused on Scrum and the process side. And if you fast forward a little bit, uh, a few years later, I think that we all grew up a bit. And we understood that as the needle moved a bit, uh, then we all understood that we all play a part, that Agile, Lean, and Craftsmanship, and DevOps came in as another movement as well, quite strong. Um, we all find, found our place, and we all now see that uh, we, are, we should all work together. Like, I don't think that individually those things are enough, but, but Craftsmanship, going back to the question, uh, was uh, a movement to bring back the focus on the engineering and quality software, and that was very developed centric. That was the history of craftsmanship. Fantastic! Thank you very much for sharing. Now, some people they call themselves software developer, others they call the, themselves software engineer or software crafter. You know. Uh, when I'm, am, I, am I a software crafter when I design or first when I did understand the principles mm -hmm. of the manifesto and then design it or how does it work? Because I, I, I think today there's still a, a lack of the, soft, of the real software crafters in the industry. The, noodle, the needle is, is still not completely yeah. went in the middle. No, I don't think it will ever will. Uh, but well, I think that, like, I, I assume that just to see if I understood, like, your question is more about what is the difference? Is that correct? Like, what is the of a soft, uh, software developer, software cross person? Is that what you are coming from? Is that just make yeah. sure that I address the right question? It's all about shared understanding, you know. Um, people claiming some titles, you know, I'm a professional mm. software engineer. Mm. What does it mean? I mean, I or what does it mean to be a, a wholehearted software crafter? Did yeah. I attend 10 code retreats, for example, or mm -hmm. did I mm -hmm. attend uh, some community meetings and really participated? Or uh... So the way I see it again, like it, it's, it's funny how those things evolve because like certain titles, they, they, they made more sense at certain periods of time, right? So as I said, when you are doing that counter movement where you are trying to really reach, uh, raise awareness of certain things, so the labels, they help, right? But the, but, but I, I'm always a bit afraid of making the knowledge that I'm <laughs> considering to make now. But, but for example, uh, for me, being a software, uh, software cross person, like in my case, because uh, I, I'm a software cross man, uh, because I identify myself this way. Uh, so 
what it means is is, a, is a summarized version, as a summarized way to describe that I subscribe to certain principles, that I look at my career uh, in a certain a specific way, and there are things that I do or as, a, as a practice on a daily basis that uh, putting that label identifies those set of principles, that without that label, it would take too long to describe what those things are. Mm. So, but, but this is important. For example, you can say, uh, let, let me, for example, a design pattern. If you put a name, you, you already know what to expect of how things mm. work. Even when you say, like, for example, I, I'm not religious myself, but when you say that you are from a particular religion, this is a, a very succinct way to explain to other people that you subscribe to a set of principles and values and behaviors. And, and the label is, is something along those lines. That doesn't mean that, for example, if you say that you subscribe to a specific religion, and I don't, that doesn't mean that we don't subscribe to the same principles and values and behaviors. But I will need you to, to describe them far more than you would because you found a term that encompasses those values, principles, and behaviors. And for me, when you say I'm a software cross person, I expect, or anyone calling themselves a cross person, that they will subscribe to a certain set of principles. But that doesn't mean that whoever, for people that don't like the metaphor, don't subscribe to the same things. Mm. Makes sense what I'm saying? Absolutely, yeah. So let's go a little bit into the details. Is it, is the craftsmanship manifesto from 2009, is it still, you know, valid and the golden rule and the, the guiding star? It's 12 years now. Yes and no. I think that, uh, to be fair, the, the software craftsmanship manifesto was never so successful as the Agile manifesto. The Agile manifesto for me is far stronger. Because Agile Manifesto was a clear cut of where we were to where we are going. The Craftsmanship Manifesto is an evolution, if you call it that way, from the Agile Manifesto. In terms of values, it doesn't move that too far from the Agile Manifesto as the, mani the Agile Manifesto moved from where we were as an industry, yeah. right? But but I so so in in that sense. Uh, for, for historical purpose, I think that we the, the Craftsmanship Manifesto was a good guide, was an evolution, but not such a big jump as the Agile Manifesto was. So does it still serve as a guidance? I think yes. But is this something that we use as a Bible, as something that we go back to all the time? No. But, but this is what I said about embracing the principles. So for example, someone that embraced the Craftsmanship principles, the way that they behave, the way that they see the world, should encompass what is written in that manifest, right? So th th that's how I see it. But I think that it's still a good guide. It's a simplistic guide. I don't think that is the complete, complete picture, but it's certainly a good guidance, no doubt. Okay. Uh, are you okay with when we go through the four sentences together and discuss, discuss it li a little bit? Um, sure. So the first sentence is, uh, it's about not only working software, but also well-crafted software. I mean, uh, everyone has some kind of, you know, uh, it's well-crafted, but mm -hmm. you know, how you do, do you define it? Uh, well-crafted is about, you know, for example, mm -hmm. code smells, solids. Yeah, so so I think that this this is one of the principles in the the, the craftsmanship manifesto that was the, the the most provocative in a way, the one that, that they were really trying to say, hey, agile, you forgot about that, <laughs> yeah, right. So so I think that the, that the intention of that was extremely key to what software craftsmanship is, but it was like, say, hey, this is what you forgot. Mm. Right. So, so, but then going back to your question, how do you define well-crafted software? And I think that uh, on the detail, on the low-level detail, we might disagree. You might think that I don't know. You might have a different view of how many 
how much behavior you should put in a certain module uh, or how to name certain things or how you structure your test. On the very low level detail, you might disagree, but in the higher level detail, what we mean by well-crafted software is software that we are not scared to change. Mm -hmm. That is a pleasure to work with, that like once the team uh, reaches an agreement, so there is, there is an explicit agreement. It's something that we deliberately thought about for me, it's less relevant that you and me agree on what well-crafted software means if we are from separate companies or projects. But mm. within your project, within your company, we deliberately thought about what well-crafted software yep. means. We, we sat down and said, look, this is how we want our code to be maintained. This is what gives us pleasure to work with. And not only pleasure as a personal satisfaction, but this is what makes, this is the kind of structure in our code base, including our tests, that makes us productive, that, that doesn't frustrate us, that allows us to get stuff done quickly. So we don't need to, there is, oh, we talk about the, the, what is it, essential complexity, there is the complexity of the business, and there is the accidental complexity that we created, so that we minimize that accidental complexity. Right, so we already need to deal with the business complexity. We should not yeah. be having to deal with, the complex that we are creating ourselves within the code base. So for me, well-crafted software is code that minimizes accidental complexity. It's a pleasure to work with. This is what I mean. The low-level details, I would rather that each team defines. I think that there are good principles, like Clean Code Book is one of my favorite books on the subject, and test-driven development, and certain methodologies, and design principles, and domain-driven design, and architectural patterns, and so on and so forth. But those are more on on the specifics, not on the general principle. Mm. Oh, thank you very much. Excellent. I'm going to ask a, ask a question from the audience, if you, might, you don't mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, from uh, from Francois, it's asking what is what is complicated. If it was complicated for you when you move from Brazil to to London uh, to work with the people there. Uh, with two IDs on uh, how what's the craft and, and so on. Um, are English people are very pragmatic? I would not like to to label like that because like I find that there are good and bad people, pragmatic and not pragmatic people everywhere and stuff. So it's a bit, always a bit dangerous when we uh, label a, a very large group of people. Right, but like what I can say for certain is that the UK market was far more mature as a whole than anywhere else in the world that I've been to, including the US. Mm -hmm. Although some of those principles were born in US, but they were certainly evolved in the UK. Right, so, so having traveled a lot myself, uh, well, between Brazil and the UK, it was like night and day in terms of maturity. But even across Europe, now, now it's different because we've been 20 years in this journey and the world is more globalized now than it was before. But the UK market uh, is very mature and they push the boundaries. And this is not only by British people, by the way, and I want to make it very clear, but the UK and London in specific end up attracting a lot of talent across the whole world. Right, so a lot of good professionals end up coming to London either to leave or they just come for a conference or, or something like that, right? So, so it is a very mature market, that is for sure. Okay. Thank you. Maybe, Alexander, we will go first through the manifesto, the, the three other sentences, and then we'll pick up uh, more questions from the audience. Yes. So yes. we have kind of the full picture of the manifesto. And uh, yeah. So the second uh, sentence is uh, not only responding to change, but also steadily adding value. So, so this one is the interesting one because like, one thing is to keep adding new things. So this is not about adding a new feature. Right, so because there are there are different types of value that you add to a system. One is for like adding a new feature you, that you satisfy a, a, sub, a subset of customers. It might generate more revenue uh, to someone, but you might also 
be creating technical debt. That while there is that immediate gain, you might be compromising the long term. So I think that when you say about steadily, steadily adding value, this is way beyond adding features. Is having more of a holistic view and caring about the entire solution uh, over time, not only for the immediate. You need to have some a good degree of pragmatism, and we can even talk about pragmatism uh, at some point today because this is a topic that I would love, to, I would love to talk about because I think that it's missing. From the because I have criticism to the craftsmanship community after 10 years myself, and lack of pragmatism is one of them, right? So, um, but I think that the steadily adding value is like in the agile world, we were always responding to change, we learned to work in a very fast pace, which mm. is good. We learned to say, you know what, throw away your plans that you created yesterday if today you know you have more information, and this is a good thing. So, that, that way of being very flexible and adapt is phenomenal in the agile. For me, this is one of the best, best, thing in, best things in the agile way of working. But we as cross people, like we need to have that vision and say like we can work in, in that way. Uh, I was even making a, uh, I had a talk, uh, I was talking about different modes of, of working. So for example, if you, we need to know, we as, as technical people, if the business is in a lean startup mode, you know that a, a constant change will be your default mode. So you need to prepare your system to support that, that continuous evolution of change. But you also need to understand that sometimes you're working in projects that are far more stable, that we are, is a B2B and we know our customers and every feature that we release, we are not making an experiment in the market. It's not like lean startup or design thinking that, oh, let's build something, throw it out there, learn, and then adapt. Sometimes we just, we can do a lot of user research. And when we release a feature, it's very specific for very few clients and need to be stable from day one. So the way that you architect your system, the way that you go about the technical solution is very different. And this is what I think about steadily adding value is taking all of that into account, not just building a new feature. Thank you very much. Yeah. The third uh, sentence is not only individual, individuals and interactions but also a community of professionals yeah this is one of the values that i like the most and this became quite key to the software craftsmanship movement which agile by the way the agile movement did very well as well the agile uh, commu uh movement has a very healthy community across the world uh and we just made it more explicit uh on the on the manifesto. So what it means is go beyond a little, it goes a bit beyond just having communities. It puts some responsibility on the software cross people to look after their own profession, right? So for example, when you say a community of professionals means that we all should look after our own profession. We should help new uh, professionals to join our industry. We have a lot of research saying that uh, our industry is reducing progressively in number of years of experience because the number of people that join our industry is increasing, which means that the, the, the average seniority level is decreasing, right? So, but it's our, and the software is becoming even more crucial to everything we do in our daily life. So it's our job. We should not wait for a government to regulate our industry. We should look after our, our industry, create a community of professionals, spread the, 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 the techniques that we today consider good and help those professionals to uh, create good software. And, and distill, and there is another thing that I would like to add, distill the right principles, the right attitude that is expected from a software professional, right? I think that this is another thing that is missing a bit. Excellent. The fourth, fourth and last sentence is, uh, not only customer collaboration, but also productive partnerships. Yeah, I have a, a, a slightly different perspective on that value from what I remember. So what they were, when I wrote my book, I expanded in, on this one a little bit beyond what was originally intended, if I'm not wrong. This is the bit where I like to talk about uh, career ownership. So it's not only like the productive partnership with our clients is, is a limited view. Like, for example, the productive partnership means like, we are not just uh, uh, like someone that is doing something 
that you were told to do. You are treating uh, your employer, and this is very important. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are a, a permanent employee, if you are a consultant working for a consultancy company or an independent uh, contractor or, or stuff. It doesn't matter. This is those, those, um, uh, those things that I mentioned are just like different types of contracts that you have, but ultimately you are still providing a service. I always say people might not know, but they are already running a company that is them. Right. Ah, okay, so, yeah. so, so you are your own company. You are a service provider that you have a specific type of contract and you are paid to provide a specific service. That contract might be a permanent contract or different contracts. But like, so in here, this is what I want to convey is that a productive partnership is more like you look at you, everyone that you work with as your clients and you are and your work is about satisfying their needs. And that goes back to my criticisms of the craftsmanship community. Uh, some of the cross criticisms that I have is like, it should not be about us. It's me doing what I think I, I want to do. It's me understanding the needs of the people that pay for my service and be able to provide the service that satisfies their needs. And that includes saying no to them. That includes educating them. That includes uh, ex uh, explaining to them different trade-offs and pros and cons of their choices and stuff. But ultimately, is that professionalism, like I'm here to provide a service. I'm paid to do that service, All right? So, and this is how I see that, that productive partnership is, is providing more than just doing what is told. This is seeing that your employees see you as someone that understands their business, understands what is being done, and you actively contribute to their success because that's what you're paid for. Mm. Perfect. Yeah. So let's pick up a couple of questions from the audience. Okay, so um, so from Ilam, how do you inspire your team to adopt that menta mentality? Hmm. This, is, this is a great question. I, I've been asked this, variations of these questions for, uh, for, for 10 years now. How do we convince our team to do TDD? How do I convince my manager to adopt, uh, to let us do pair programming and, and inspire? This, this question is even better because it's more about inspiration. So first of all, uh, I would say to you, be ready, be prepared to be frustrated. You don't inspire people just because you want to, right? So you can only be in, you can only control your own attitudes, but you cannot control how people will react to your attitudes, right? So, so this is why I say be prepared to be disappointed. Uh, but for me, I cannot go to anyone or, or like anyone about, we, we cannot go to other people and say, hey, you should do this, right? Because if someone like, think the other way around, if someone comes to me and say, hey, Sandra, you know the way you work? Yeah, it sucks. Right, so everything you've been doing for 10 years or 20 is shit because you should do this kind of technique Crap. or you should behave this way. Or if you don't do this thing, you are not a professional. How would you feel about that? I would tell the person to say, hey, screw you, right? So, so who do you think you are, right? So, and this is very important for you to understand that you cannot just go to people and say that whatever they do is wrong and you know how things should be done. So for me, the, the inspiration happens as a side effect, right? You be who you are, you believe in what you believe, you behave in the ways that you believe, and you, and you, and you think about like, how can I be an example? So if I want to, con to distill a certain behavior or uh, people to adopt a certain technique, I need to be the example. I need to behave like that. I need to master the technique. I cannot go to people and say, hey, stop working the way that you that you work today and adopt this technique. And by the way, I'm a shit at it, right? So how does that work? Why would I stop doing what I'm doing to follow someone that is shit at what they are saying that they want me to do? So be an exemplar. Arrive on time. Contribute to the business. Be proactive. Treat people well. And, when, and if you're talking about technical uh, disciplines, Make sure that you bloody master them. That when you grab the keyboard and people see you coding, they will say like, fucking hell, I want you to do that. 
So just be awesome at what you do. And then maybe, maybe you will inspire a few people. Right. Awesome. How are you going to do? Alexander, uh, no, I, yeah, let's pick some more mind. questions from the audience. Okay. So the question from Henry. I saw a talk, Agile is dead. <laughs> Which one of the reasons is due to the business around being certified, safe, and etc. Is there is a possibility that craftsmanship follow the same path? <sighs> so every time that I see something is dead, I already just go to the next thing. I just stop paying attention at that point immediately. Because like, first of all, I don't know who gave the talk because there are quite a few of them. Like if you say X is dead, you find tons of things. TDD is dead, Agile is dead, Scrum is dead, Lean is dead, Craftsmanship, everything is dead, right? So uh, I, I don't really pay attention. I, I think that, uh, as I said, I see craftsmanship as a set of principles, as a set of uh, values, uh, as a way of seeing the world. And while I see this way, it will never be dead to me, right? So if people liked it or not, uh, for me, this is just a, uh, this is another thing that we can talk a little bit more is the difference between a mindset and uh, practices or methodologies, like between an ideology and a methodology. So for me, craftsmanship is more on the ideology side, the same way that Agile is. While Scrum is a methodology, Agile is an ideology. While craftsmanship is an ideology, extreme programming is a methodology, right? So ideology cannot be dead while there is at least one person believing on that. It might be dead to other people, but while I see these as a set, as a way to describe a set of values, behaviors, and attitudes that I subscribe to, it will always be alive to me. So that, that's mm -hmm. how I see this. Yes, yeah, I agree, I agree. But by the way, the, the person that brought Agile is dead, it was just an appeal title. And when you read it, the article, it was saying exactly the contrary. It was saying, no, Agile is not mm -hmm. dead, it's a mindset. You cannot, you cannot kill a mindset. If you want to kill some a mindset, you need to kill all the believers of this yeah. mindset. Yeah. yeah, so that's fun. Yeah, because I've seen a lot of different things, but normally, like, yeah. So I don't like the, the, the title. The title puts me off a bit. Uh, but anyway, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's uh, pick up another question from the audience. I think. Okay, oh, from Peter. From the Zurich yeah, Software Conference. Peter. So what influence the attitude of a professional software, software engineer and which one of this is the hardest to change? So sorry, can you re repeat the question again? Yeah, what influence the attitude of a professional software engineer and which one of this is the, hold on, wait a second, the question just jumped. Mm -hmm. And I don't see it anymore. And which one of these oh, yeah. attitudes yeah. is the hardest to change? Yes, that's it. Yeah. There are pos maybe a lot of influences. Uh, yeah, th th this is a very, yeah, th this is a very difficult question uh, to answer because I, I believe that I might be in different st in different states of mind. So if you ask me this question repeatedly over a period of time, and I'm in different states of mind, I might give a completely different answer because I will always associate to what is hardest for me right now or the things that, I, that I'm that i more, uh, not, not worried or disappointed. I was more, I was thinking more recently. So one thing that, as I said, like, I think that understanding that you are service, you are service provider as I said, as an individual, you're paid to do a job. Understanding that you need to master like the skills within your profession, you need to know the different techniques and how they apply. And you also develop preferences for those things. But when you are providing a service, you cannot only just impose what you want to do. I think that one thing that was difficult and quite frustrating for a lot of craftspeople is understanding that 
when we are providing a service, we need to take, we have a big toolkit. And as people, as geeks, we like some tools more than others, right? But when you are in a professional environment, I need to understand what are the real constraints? What are my client really needs? And sometimes I'll need to do things that I might not, might not be my preferred way, but it's the right thing for that context. Uh, and this is not about cutting corners. This is about understanding real constraints and tailoring your solution to according to those constraints and be happy about it because you are providing a service and that is the right thing to do. So you should not be frustrated. So again, given the, the kind of company that I have today, the kind of problems that I have today, that would be my answer today is understanding that there are, there's me as a professional, understanding loads of techniques and how the world could be beautiful, given no constraints. And there are the service that I provide and be able to tailor the solutions according to the needs of my clients without ever being frustrated. So creating that, that wall, I call it uh, internally at Cojunas, I call that um, creating a professional wall. Imagine a different way of talking about that is imagine uh, doctors, imagine psychologists, mm. certain types of lawyers. Those people, they deal with real problems. If we think that we have problems, imagine those nurses and doctors. Yeah working shifts of 12 hours, 24 hours, those craziness that they were, that is fucking pressure, right? So, but they need to go home every day and sleep. They are dealing with people that might have serious problems. They might die next day, one way or another. And they need to go home and sleep every night without letting those problems affecting their personal lives because those people have kids, they have families, they have their own problems. So they need to go home and sleep so that next day they are fresh so they can see the world objectively and address those problems. And this is what we need to learn because we have far easier, it's much easier for us, right? If we are worried because we have a difficult conversation with a manager and this is affecting our weekend, we have a lot to evolve as professionals. So for me, one of the, another thing that we should evolve and it's a very difficult thing to do is build that professional wall. And the professional wall means that you are still, you care a lot about the problem, but you don't let the problem affect you personally. Because as soon as the problems at work affect you personally, you lose objective, you, you lose the critical distance to work to address that properly. So this is for me today, one of the, the things that is the most difficult things for people to learn. Some professions, they dress up, for example, the doctor, dresses up as a doctor and then uh, the professional wall is probably automatically installed mm. we, we don't have it we have the cool shirts and <laughs> hanging around the coffee machine you, you, you know that what you said is very interesting because like we were discussing the early days of the pandemic one thing that i do until today when i go to work just before this call i just uh changed a bit but like the i dress every day i work in my home office right but i dress as if I was going to the office. You represent, you represent your company and the values of your yes. company by wearing the shirts. And I was explaining to the people as well. I don't want to see two people without shirts or with like uh, no sleeves and stuff. And so look, this is a professional environment. So make sure that you are dressed properly. You are working. And then you can, as soon as I go out of that door over there, then, then I create, you need to create that separation because otherwise you go mental. Right. Yeah, it's, a, it's better for the for the mentor to to have a switch so every morning like me every morning i wake up at the same time that i was going to work i change myself i take my shower take my breakfast and etc and then i enter in my room that's my office here wearing clothes that are off as i was going to work mm -hmm. and then when I finish the day i go out maybe i go to take a shower i change myself and finish. So if there's a, a break between the work and the life. If you don't do this, yeah, it's not gonna finish very well. Exactly. Yeah, because then you don't you always working or always having free time. So I'm gonna take an, another question. Uh, I'm gonna if oh, yeah, 
I'm going to take the, the same question that Peter. It's uh, the same question I had. So, like me, for example, I I believe that software craftsmanship is not just about coding. It's about understand the needs to the delivery. It's a full. It's a full. It's just not coding because a lot of people think it's uh, software craftsmanship is about coding, writing TDD, and, and finish. And so. What you can say if you talk with the developers and they say to you, oh, yeah, but my, me, the business is not for me. I'm a coder. They should just tell us what to code. So, well, um, I can say quite a lot of things. First of all, uh, one thing that I could say to them, uh, if they are open to listen as well, because some people, they just life you need to teach them. Right, there's no, there's, no, there's no amount of things that you can say to them at a certain period of their life that they're gonna listen. Life, but life first. And one thing that I could say is that they are limiting themselves. They are taking a very narrow perspective of what they can be as a professional. And there is one thing about what they love doing. And I love coding myself, but given where I am in my career today, coding is the least important skill that I apply on a daily basis, right? So, but it doesn't mean that I that I don't like coding anymore. So I think that they, they and you go through phases as well, because you are, you're, the things that you like and where you put effort, they change over time as well. But like, I think what is important for me, I don't mind what you are focusing on at the moment, but just don't limit yourself. Don't be too limited in a, in a very, don't put yourself in a box on the square. So yes, focus in one area, become a special, specialize in one area or, more, or two or three, but keep yourself open. Don't throw away opportunities to learn other disciplines. Uh, so this is one thing that I would say. Another thing is that uh, for me, this is their personal choice. They should do what, with their lives, whatever they want to do. But what I would have an issue is that if they say that this is craftsmanship, then I would have an issue with that. Whatever they, they Whatever they feel that is good for them, and that's how they want to live their lives, for me, more than happy for them to, to do whatever makes them happy. And, right, so I have no issues. Each person should choose their own path. But saying that craftsmanship is about test-driven development or naming functions, I would have a big issue with that. Thank you. Okay, so... Uh Let's pick up some questions uh, we already prepared. For example, uh, you founded the company Codurance, and I guess all the people working for you, they are software crafters, or, or the ones that write software. It, you, it, it, or, this, used, this used to be true when we were much smaller. Now we have a marketing department, a sales department, okay, but people's the, department, the, the, but yes. People that, that touch the codes, they're still software crafters. The core business, yeah, the, the, the core business, they are all software crafters, yes. Can you hire them already with that mindset, you know, and that attitude, or uh, do you build that up first before they work for Codurance for, for your customers? I cannot say, I would be lying if I said that everyone in the company today has that mindset or had that mindset before they joined. Uh, so Codurance as, an, as a normal company, like we are a hundred people today, right? So, and we are growing. Uh, so of course that is not, I cannot say that we have a, a, a unique culture for every single person. So of course there are differences. So, but in general, they already have the mindset. The vast majority of people, what we try our best in our interview process, and this is not easy, is quite often we lower the bar on the technical side when the person compensates on the attitude. No, now we, we are becoming a bit smarter. Before, at the beginning, we were more focused on the technical side, um, and this balance is tipping now. I think that we are more interested in the, the we learned as well. Uh, also, like, it's difficult because, like, the company went, th like, Codinacy is seven and a half years old. And you go through stages. When we were 10 people, there was a certain kind of profiles that we needed. When you were 100 and any, anything in between, it changed. 
So for example, today we have far more uh, opportunities, we have far more resources in, to invest on people. We have an academy pro program. So for us, the, 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 the mindset is far more important because teaching TDD, if we as a company cannot teach TDD, then there is something seriously wrong with, seriously wrong with us, right? But what I cannot teach is attitude. That willingness to do well, to be better, not because the, the boss is saying, is asking them or the client is asking, it's because they want to be good because they want to be good. That I cannot teach. I can try to inspire, but, but it's a very difficult process. So there are other people that already have that in them, and then we train them on the technical disciplines. Uh, this is what we try to do. But, uh, but, I, uh, but I would be lying if we say that we get right all the time, because that's also not true. Yeah. We, we sometimes get it wrong. So you skill them up then by the academy you have and do you also have something other for example apprenticeship journeyman master no. or so a program or, or pair programming you know all this pair programming pair with the senior no this side of the metaphor we never embraced not even during the community even before codurance this this thing about the apprentice the journeyman the master this, this is, is from this uncle is... bob isn't it or I'm not even sure if it's from Bob. Yeah. I think this is more from uh, Bob. Might have mentioned that a few times, but I, knowing him and what he's done, I I don't think that he ever took that too serious or, or were too strict about that. I think that this is this is the meta. This is the part that comes with the real craftsmanship metaphor from the medieval times. But I don't yeah, think that okay. it was ever really applied in the modern days when we start talking about software craftsmanship. Uh, so I don't believe in the master journeyman. I don't like that. I don't think that it works well. But we have levels of seniority within Pujurans. We have uh, the apprentice. We renamed uh, the apprenticeship program that we had to academy now. So we had to adapt as well because uh, we also need to to adapt to the market. For example, when you say apprenticeship program, mm -hmm. the UK government has an apprenticeship program which is very well known across the entire country. So, but the apprenticeship program that is popular in the UK means taking uh, people that didn't go to university so that they learn yep. some, some basic skills. So it's very different from like we aiming to get people that have been in the industry for already a few years so that we yeah. can polish them to become consultants. So we had to change the name. So now we call it academy instead of apprenticeship just to remove the ambiguity. People that are within the craftsmanship community Never had a problem with that. But as a business, we reach out to people that were not part of the community and we remove the ambiguity. But we have seniority levels. So I think we do, to be very honest, I think we do a much better job at the base of taking people with few years of experience and, and giving them the, the basic technical skills. But we don't do a good job yet of having them continue their journey to become a fully fledged consultant with all the, this is what we are working on at the moment, but the base, the base we do well, but we don't do well the, the upper levels yet as a company. What, what do you think about people are, uh, who just finished the university, you know, studied computer science? So, I mean, they probably don't have this uh, crafter mind set don't they no no not well i think that some of them might have but not with that name so for example i believe that quite a few of us had that but not with that name for example what we had was that passion for example yeah. even during university or even people that didn't go to university because we have we find quite a few of those cases but for example is not it's quite common within the craftsmanship community to find people that started coding when they were a teenager. Yeah. Right? That they were already playing, either building some games or, or some stuff like that. So, so that curiosity, that passion of building something with code, not, not the quality of what they were building, but they cared about building something and, and they had their own notion of quality. Uh, if it doesn't match, even if, when it doesn't match our more professional knowledge. 
So, but, but that that instinct of really liking and trying to do something well, you still find that. You, yeah. you, you find that. Okay, Alexander, do we have some interesting questions from the audience? Uh, some interesting questions. Um, yeah, okay, I'm gonna take this one because the, the other one is, okay. So there's your first question, how would you respond to, we are not an agile business, this model is not working for us. <laughs> so so that, there, is a, there, are, there are a few tricks in here. Stop using the term. This is what we learn. Don't use the term. So like when, when you use the, 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 the name agile, or even craftsmanship, or even test driven development, or scrum, or whatever, stop if you are in, in, in the scrum community yeah by by all means use scrum all the time and craftsmanship and tdg and so on and so forth if you identify this is this is this is where you need to really be smart if you want to drive technical change and stuff is stop providing solutions or naming solutions because people might have different understanding i wrote a full chapter about the driving technical change and there is a great book with the same name that's where i got the inspiration for the chapter itself uh so read that book uh it's called driving technical change so in in that book and in, in the chapter that i wrote and i added a few uh stereotypes or skepticals there are different types of people some people for example they heard about scrum let's say or agile and maybe from people that they trust and those people had a bad experience god knows why or even they tried their own version of what, whatever they call Agile, and that didn't work. So then, if you force on the turn, you, you are in a losing battle. So try to understand the underlying problems that they are trying to solve. And agree on the problem first. This is what I always say to our people internally. Don't go to your client or team leads or whoever with a solution first. Because Agile is a solution, cross, uh, TDD is a solution, Extreme Programming is a solution, Scrum is a solution. All of those things are solutions. But if you fail to agree on the problem first, that solution will never be accepted. So stop naming those things outside the community and have a conversation about what are your pain points? What do you think, like go to this person and say like, what do you think that is not working well here? What is keeping you awake at night? What are the problems that you would like to resolve? What are the things that you'd like to achieve and you are not able to? And what do you think are the blocks for achieving that? You start there. You start trying to agree on what the problems are first. Because then the, the, what happens when you do that, you don't have like you versus me or your idea versus mine. You are trying to align our understanding of the problems and then you are in a much safer space to say, hey, instead of us, so maybe we are not talking enough or, or there are people doing things and we are not aware. What if we did a sync up every day? If every day we had a quick chat where we, we share with each other what we are doing or if there is anything blocking us or you know what? I know that things change very often, so, but what if you try to, I don't know, block like at least for a week, we, we agree on, on what we want to achieve. And if something changes, we change on the following week, but not during that week. So we give us a self, an opportunity to work for in a thing for a longer period of time. And we demo that, like we, we can get feedback. So see, see what I'm saying? Or for example, if we are spending time doing the testing, why don't we try to automate? And, and, and if we do that later, it's much harder. Why don't we try to do that first? So what if while we are building the software, we write the test at the same time so that we know. So see what I'm saying? So you're not saying we should adopt TDD or Scrum or dailies or stuff. You are just trying to identify problems and, and, and agree on a potential experiment. Another thing that uh, you need to bear in mind when you're driving technical change one of the things that people are very reactive, for example, if you come to me and say, hey, Sandra, we should change this. And by the way, if we make a decision today, you need to commit for 12 months. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> or forever. <laughs> exactly, or forever, exactly. So one of the biggest reasons that people say no to something is because they don't want to have a long-term commitment. So how can you reduce that? Because you can go there instead of saying, we should adopt Scrum and run everything in an agile fashion and stuff. It's like, what if we tried for the next two weeks to run the team? Like, propose an experiment. Because it's much harder for someone. You really need to be a certain type of person to, to reject an experiment that is short when you really have a problem. So say, hey, what if you give us a chance to work, to, to, to try this, this thing for the next two weeks? And then we talk again after two weeks. We have, we have a conversation to see how, what we found, what, what we thought, how, how do you think that it went? what we liked and disliked, and then we try again. This is a much better way for you to, to try to push ideas because you are reducing the, co the size of the commitment. Right? So think about that. Agree on the problem, reduce the size of the commitment from that decision. To use uh, things like the, the Toyota cutter, the improvement cutter, or the popcorn flow, to, to run through these stages like problems, observations, options, running experiments, or do you, do, do you have a special we use name? Some or? Of them. Right, I, I think that some, some of those techniques are, are good in different contexts. I think that they are all valid techniques in different contexts. I like the popcorn uh, exercise. Uh, we use a few other ones as well. One of the exercises, for example, in terms of workshops in, in reaching visibility or agreeing where the problems are. One of the ones, one of the I like the most is value stream mapping. It's one of my favorite. It's from an idea to software in production. What happens? What are the different steps? Who gets involved? Uh, how long it takes? When things go wrong in each step, how further back it goes? So painting that picture with different people and having different people that know nice. parts of the project. Yeah, because what, what you have is like, Different people knows well different parts of the project, but very rarely there is a single person that knows the, the process uh, from top to bottom. And, and the outcome is like everyone looks at that. If you facilitate that well, they all look at it. And it's like, fucking hell, is this how we work? Yes, that's how you work. Those are all the different <laughs> points of inefficiency that we have. So among them, which one is the priority? Mm -hmm. So this is a much better way to approach problem instead of just say, I want to convince my team to use TDD or the Scrum or whatever. This will come mm -hmm. later. Excellent. Okay. Now, uh, the, the first hour is, is over and I think we can, could continue forever. Uh, <laughs> uh, but let's open up the discussion and move over to the wonder session. I will post uh, the link in the Big Marker chat, but uh, the people in the Big Marker session, you will automatically redirect it. This is just in case something breaks and you won't get redirected. It will be the URL wonder.juke.ch. Okay. Okay. So, okay, so when I click on just for me uh, to understand, so if I go to wonder.jug.ch, uh, then yep. I will get to the right place. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So for the people that will not follow us or to wonder, uh, just to know, uh, in two weeks we have uh, so in the community in the Romandi community we we'll have uh, Terry Cross is one of the oldest French coach, uh, an extreme programming coach. One of the oldest one, he started really nearly at the beginning. Uh, he's going to come to present a subject on us. And then we have uh, Marco Consolero, the 25th of May. And in June, I think it's the 22 of June, we have Uncle Bob. Very cool, very cool. That's Good really lineup. Cool. <laughs> and then yeah. it will be the holiday and we'll see back again in, uh, in August with uh, a really cool program. With some more uh, excellent software crafters of all yeah. around the world. Yeah. So this uh, session, it will be, or it, it is recorded and uh, we will publish it uh, on YouTube later on our channel, channels. 
and that's it. Um, for those who are not joining us afterwards, uh, have a nice evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you for asking questions and interacting with, with us. And uh, see you right now in the Wonder session. Bye-bye.